Captain has just turned on the seatbelt sign in preparation for landing at the Greater Cincinnati Airport. Thank you. As often as I make that trip, Pittsburgh and back, I'm always impressed. Coming into Cincinnati, you get a good look at the river, the Ohio, miles of it. The shipping, factories, the cities. It's something everyone ought to see. Rivers, the big ones, have a genuine fascination. We write about them, sing about them, and there's a reason. This country wouldn't be the same without its rivers, especially the Ohio. Back even before the Declaration of Independence, that word, Ohio, had a magic in it. The American settler was headed west, and so was the Ohio. He floated downstream and built his farms and towns near the river. Before long, the settler changed the Ohio into a highway for trade by shipping his farm goods to market. You see, the settler knew the value of water transportation. He knew that if he carried his goods to market in a wagon, his mule could pull only a limited load. But if the same mule was harnessed to a barge, his load is unlimited. It's just a law of physics. Things move easier on water. In modern times, if goods and materials are not bulky and to the door delivery is the requirement, modern trucking will do the job just fine. When the bulk of the cargo becomes greater and distance is a factor, the modern diesel train is the answer. But when materials are shipped in tens of thousands of tons and advanced planning has scheduled its arrival, a modern towboat cannot be beat. If the cargo is heavy and bulky, the cost of moving it on a water highway is normally lower than by any other method. That's why the Ohio is a busy trade route today. Busier every year. It saves money for modern Americans, just as it did for the first settlers. At first glance, the story of the Ohio seems pretty straightforward. A long water highway, economical transportation, adding up to a busy and prosperous trade. Well, there's much more to it than that. The Ohio, by nature, is a lion, stubborn and strong-willed. It's been America's job to put the lion in a cage, and that's quite a story. From prehistoric times until, well, around the gay 90s, the Ohio operated on its own terms, when it wanted and how it wanted. We just did the best we could with the situation. You can understand the problem if you picture a rooftop during a rainstorm. When it rains, water runs deep. It will flow as long as the supply continues, but since the roof is steep, it will quickly run off. The Ohio in the old days was much the same. It's a steep river, dropping 460 feet in the 981 miles from Pittsburgh to the Mississippi. In the winter 
and spring, as snow melted all along the Ohio watershed, there was plenty of water. The paddle wheel steamboats could move along the river easily. When the steamboats were on the move, the economy prospered, temporarily. When there were dry seasons, there was trouble. Water ran off the steep Ohio as it runs off a roof. The level often dropped so low that a man could wade across the river in many places. The river boats just sat and waited, and prosperity slowed to a walk, a situation which a growing young country couldn't tolerate for long. Between 1879 and 1910, Congress authorized, as an investment in a natural resource, the construction of 54 locks and dams, the cage to control the unreliable Ohio. The dams transformed the river into a series of pools, keeping the water from running off in dry seasons. Now the riverboats moved goods and people all year round. Prosperity became a full-time operation. Each of the dams, stretching from bank to bank, would have been a block to the riverboats without the installation of locks. The lock is a water escalator which moves boats and barges to either the upstream or downstream level. The level is changed by emptying the water from the lock chamber or to go upstream by refilling it. By 1929, 46 locks and dams were completed. The Ohio was now a year-round highway. In the years since 1929, the Ohio has become a river highway that churns with activity. Any time of the year, day or night, at any one of those locks and dams, you'll see the caged Ohio in action. Toes moving up and down the long water highway, feeding a swelling river prosperity they now call the Ohio Valley Boom. The dams maintain pools of water to a constant depth of nine feet or more. Water for people and industry. Water for year-round transportation. The story of the booming traffic past these dams and past each lock can be read in the steady, sure movement of the heavyweight river cargoes. It can be read in the scars on the lock walls and of the hard-working gates. The proof is there to see. This is an investment which has been put to maximum use. The lock gates open today to nearly four times as much tonnage per year as they did in 1930. Barges move in and through the locks, carrying each ton of their cargoes more than three times as far as they did when the locks were young. Tons and miles are the measure of river activity. On the Ohio, the increase in ton miles since 1930 has boomed from one and a half billion then to nearly 19 billion ton miles today. That's 13 times more. And there were people, believe it or not, who thought the Ohio was busy in 1930. Heavy cargo, big toes, long miles. That's the Ohio today. The locks and dams were ready, luckily, for the Second World War. When enemy submarines cut down our coastal shipping, the Ohio carried its full share of the extra load. It had a fine war record. My branch of the service, the Army Corps of Engineers, supervise the construction of the locks and dams, and we operate them in the name of Congress. The locks and dams on the Ohio led to further modernization. The nine-foot minimum depth of the river made it possible to introduce a new kind of towboat. Deep water brought the diesel-powered towboat to the river.
Its diesel engines produce thousands of horsepower, driving efficient high-speed propellers, which could not be used in shallow water. Therefore, the propeller has replaced the old steam-powered paddle wheel. Speed and efficiency, youthfulness has come to the towboat. In the pilot house, communications are right up to date. There's radio telephone to reach headquarters and shortwave radio to contact other towboats and lock masters. It's one of the longest and most interesting party lines in the world. The pilot has direct control over both speed and direction on a modern diesel, a major contribution to safety and good piloting. Modern, too, are the crew quarters, air-conditioned and home-like. But one thing hasn't changed, the food. It's man's food, and it's usually eaten in contented silence. There are even new ways to do many old jobs on the river. One example, a device to tighten and loosen the cables which tie the barges together. Fog, storm, and darkness once shut the Ohio down. Radar, sweeping the hidden river on all sides, has solved that problem. When the pilot can't see the river ahead of his tow, he turns to radar. Now he can see clearly both tow and river. Radar has made the Ohio a 24-hour-a-day river. When you analyze the steep rise in Ohio River traffic, all these factors play a part. The locks and dams, diesel power, and radar. But to understand exactly how the Ohio Valley economic boom has happened, you have to know about the cargoes the Ohio carries. That's the heart of the story, the reason why everything else has been done. Of all the cargoes, coal is undisputed king. The Ohio flows through fields which produce three-fourths of the nation's bituminous coal. Some 40 million tons of coal move on the Ohio annually, more than four times the level of 1930. Most of the coal shipped on the Ohio reaches customers located right on the riverbanks. The cost of barged coal has, in fact, attracted much new industry to the river, a major reason for the boom in the Ohio Valley economy. Coal's largest customer is the electric power industry, which burns the coal to produce steam for its generators. Electric power plants have multiplied in the valley in recent years, bringing with them a host of other industries. The formula is a simple one. Coal costs less in the Ohio Valley. Electricity can, therefore, be generated for less and low-cost electricity attracts power-consuming industries. The boom pyramids higher and higher. Low-cost electricity has attracted two and a half billion dollars of atomic energy projects, plants which produce U-235 fuel for atomic devices. Abundant power has attracted new aluminum smelters, which now produce more than half our national aluminum output. So vital is barged coal to this generation and consumption of electric power, that in the Ohio Valley, you will often hear electricity described as coal by wire.
Another power-consuming, coal-consuming Ohio Valley industry is steel, user of many riverborne cargoes. Scrap metal, pig iron, and other materials for steel. The Ohio's coal moves to steel mills all along the river. It's converted to coke for the steel making process. Steel has long used the river to ship raw materials and finished products and also consumes great quantities of river water. The Ohio is Main Street for one of the great steel producing areas of the world. Every year, the steel industry ships about four million tons of its products along the Ohio. Some of it, such as pipe for the oil country, traveling as much as 2,500 river miles to its destination. Coil and sheet steel are unloaded from barges and shipped by truck and train to manufacturing plants sometimes far from the river. Economical Ohio Valley coal and electricity have helped to keep the cost of such steel down. And that means lower cost steel products for families in St. Louis, Houston, Columbus, New Orleans, and in many other cities distant from the valley. The journey made by sand and gravel is much shorter. They begin their travels in midstream, dredged from the river bottom and move to the banks. They will become material for buildings and highways throughout the growing Ohio Valley. Chemical plants are enjoying a billion dollar boom along the Ohio, brought by river transportation, abundant water supply, and plenty of natural resources. If you hear someone talking about America's chemical river, it's the Ohio. Oil and gasoline are major cargoes, moving for the most part from pipeline terminals and refineries to customers all along the river, as well as its tributaries. From the surrounding farmlands come products of the fine Ohio Valley soil, just as in the days of the settlers, when the Ohio first became a great commercial highway. It all adds up to one thing, people, a hard-working, prosperous people settled beside the Ohio, building cities that built America, industrial cities, such as Wheeling, West Virginia, the friendly city. Huntington, West Virginia, the jewel city. Louisville, Kentucky, at the falls of the Ohio River. Cincinnati, Ohio, queen city of the river. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where the Monongahela and Allegheny meet to form the Ohio where it all begins, gateway to the west.
owners have clearly defined legal rights to use the locks. A man can cover a lot of country when he goes cruising, all the way to New Orleans if he chooses. The Ohio is an open waterway for every American, for business or for pleasure. The people have invested in the river, and the river has returned not only prosperity, but plenty of fun in the bargain. You can see why I enjoy coming over the Ohio on my air trips. It's not only beautiful, it's prosperous. A river that means a lot to all of us. So it might surprise you to learn that there are problems on the Ohio. Big problems. Ironically, the same locks and dams which brought prosperity are now choking the growth of that prosperity. We've got ourselves a king-sized traffic jam. You can see them any day, racing to get to the lock first. There's good reason. When they get to the lock, they may find four or five toes backed up, waiting their turn. And the last man in line could wait as long as five to ten hours. As the tow boats were improved, the size of the toes was increased, which means we're locking 1,200 foot toes through 600 foot locks. And there's only one way to do it, by a process called double locking. The pilot first steers the forward half of his toe into the lock. Then the toe is broken and the second half backs away. The upper gate is then closed and the forward half of the toe is lowered. The lower gate opens and the barges are pulled out. The lower gate is closed and the lock chamber is refilled. The upper gate is again opened to admit the balance of the toe. The gate is closed and the second section is lowered. Leaving the lock, it is rejoined to the forward barges and then continues on its way. Double locking takes about an hour and a half. Multiply that by the hundreds of large toes on the river and repeat it at a lock, an average of every 21 miles. The sum total is a five o'clock rush hour, 24 hours a day. Needless to say, we have to do something about a situation like that. Just as we once had to do something about the problem of runoff on the Ohio. Along the 981 miles of the Ohio, we had, you'll remember, installed 46 locks and dams. Today, 46 probable traffic jams. Now, Congress has once again stepped in, approving a program to replace those structures with 19 larger locks and dams to stretch out the pools of open water. The highway is becoming a turnpike. In place of the old locks of 600 feet, the cause of the long delays of double locking, we are building locks which are twice as long, 1,200 feet. The long tow, which must spend 90 minutes double locking in an old lock, locks straight through the new one in about 20 minutes. Result, no traffic jam. We're in a tight race building these new locks and dams, the improvements running neck and neck with the growth of river traffic. Building a lock and dam installation is a major piece of engineering. It takes one and one half years just to get the structure down on blueprints and another six years to build it. 
On the average, it also takes about $60 million. The new dams are of the high, lift-gated crest type. Each contains enough concrete to build 70 miles of interstate highway. These new structures are colossal compared to the old style. They'll hold back as much as a 37-foot wall of water. Each of the dams has two separate locks, one 1,200 feet and the other 600 feet. It costs less to build these 19 new locks and dams than to repair and modernize the old ones. With a fully modernized Ohio River, the valley and the nation will prosper more. The program will cost about a billion dollars, but we'll get it all back, and then some. At the completion of each lock and dam, a formal dedication is held. A pleasant American-style ritual with a little 4th of July flavor. The locks and dams belong to the people who pay taxes and who come to dedications to enjoy seeing their money well spent. And well spent it is. Each structure is an engineering triumph, a source of pride for every American. It's a gigantic task, this transformation of the Ohio. But remember, we are making an investment in ourselves, one which adds materially to our nation's wealth and prosperity. Think of the Ohio as a young man, its waters swift with excitement and ambition, steeped with the promise of growth and greatness. The Ohio, therefore, belongs not only to the states through which it flows, it belongs to every American, for every American benefits in some way from its being.